Later, knowing that all was now completed, Jesus said, It is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Jesus was dead. Now, it was a day of preparation, and the next day was to be a special Sabbath. Because the Jews did not want the bodies left on the crosses during the Sabbath, they asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. The soldiers, therefore, came and broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with Jesus, and then those of the other. But when they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. Jesus was dead. So as the evening approached, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the council, who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Pilate was surprised to hear that he was already dead, but he gave the body to Joseph. So Joseph bought some linen cloth, took down the body, wrapped it in the linen, and placed it in a tomb cut out of rock. Then he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Jesus was dead. The Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. The gates and doors were barred and all the windows fastened down. I spent the night in sleeplessness and rose at every sound. Half in hopeless sorrow and half in fear the day would find the soldiers breaking through to drag us all away. And just before the sunrise, I heard something at the wall. The gate began to rattle and a voice began to call. I hurried to the window and looked down into the street, expecting swords and torches and the sound of soldiers' feet. There was no one there but Mary, so I went down to let her in. John stood there beside me. She told us where she'd been. She said they moved him in the night and none of us knows where the stone's been rolled away and now his body isn't there we both ran toward the garden then john ran on ahead we found the stone and the empty tomb just the way that mary said but the winding sheet they wrapped him in was just an empty shell and how where they taken him Well, something strange had happened there, but just once I didn't know. John believed a miracle, but I just turned to go. Circumstance and speculation couldn't lift me very high, because I'd seen them crucify him. And then I saw him die. Back inside the house again, the guilt and anguish came. Everything I promised him just added to my shame. When at last it came to choices, I denied I knew his name. And even if he was alive, it wouldn't be the same. But suddenly the air was filled with strange and sweet perfume. Life that came from everywhere drove shadows from the room. Jesus stood behind me 
with his arms held open wide and I fell down on my knees and just clung to him and cried he raised me to my feet and as I looked into his eyes love was shining out from him like sunlight from the skies guilt and my confusion disappeared in sweet release Every fear I'd ever had just melted into peace. Keep standing. Christ is risen. Behold, his cross is empty. Why do you look for the living among the dead? Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me will live even though he dies. Death has been swallowed up in victory. The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. The transformation of our lives and God's world begins with the acknowledgement that God is God and we are not that Jesus is Lord over sin, death, and the devil. We come to him then, confessing our sins, seeking his gracious forgiveness. With sincere hearts and minds, let us confess our sins before God our Father, first in the quiet of our hearts, and then together in the spoken confession. Lord Jesus Christ, you are the victor over death and the grave. You have risen from the tomb. We also want to rise victoriously over the death and defeat we face every day. We confess, Lord, that we so easily live only for ourselves. We have neglected to live wholeheartedly for you and others. We are trapped in tombs of self-centeredness and need the power of your forgiveness to free us. Roll away the stone of sin and crush the hardness of our hearts. Let us die to sin and be raised to new life in you through your resurrection. Amen. Jesus has carried our sins to his own death. His sacrifice is complete and full. He has won the victory. Hardened hearts are crushed. Stone walls of sin have been rolled away. In Jesus' name and by his sacrifice, our sins are forgiven. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 
Christ is risen. And you may be seated. Scriptures for this Resurrection Sunday, the first reading from the book of Acts, chapter 10, where we hear the fullness of God's love and how far that extends ultimately to all people. Then Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel, announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. You know what has happened throughout the province of Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John preached how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil, because God was with him. We are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him on a cross, but God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. He was not seen by all the people, but by witnesses whom God had already chosen, by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. This is the word of the Lord. And the epistle 
from St. Paul's letter to the Colossians, chapter 3. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things, for you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. This is the word of the Lord. And we remain seated for the scripture in motion presentation of the Easter story for Matthew chapter 28, the gospel reading for this Resurrection Sunday. After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, He has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshiped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. This is the gospel of the Lord. Christ is risen. Now don't be afraid. It's kind of a weird thing to say, isn't it? I mean, why do you throw that into this glorious celebration? Well, if we think about it, do not be afraid has been a part of the Easter story from the very beginning. Let's step back through this once again. Let's go back to Palm Sunday, week before what we're celebrating today. Jesus is riding triumphantly into Jerusalem, being hailed as king with palm branches waving, shouts of Hosanna, and blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And he gets called out by the religious leaders who came up to him and said, hey, Jesus, tell those followers of yours to stop saying these things. It's wrong. It's not right. They were afraid because it seemed like Jesus was changing everything. The next day, on Monday of Holy Week, Jesus went to the temple and he overturned the tables of the money changers, created quite a stir that undoubtedly unnerved, maybe even scared, some of those money changers who were selling. And Jesus yelled, stop turning my father's house into this den of robbers. You can only imagine his disciples, his friends who were there with him, were also maybe a little taken aback little scared because this was not a side of Jesus that they were accustomed to seeing. And then we had to Thursday night, the upper room. Jesus is transforming the Passover meal into what we know today as the Lord's Supper. And during the meal, he gets up, he takes off his outer garment wraps a towel around his waist, and he starts 
washing his disciples' feet. Again, a bit of an unnerving experience, unsettling for his disciples who revere Jesus as teacher, master. And here he is going around doing the task of the lowest, most menial servant. And then as he goes on through that night, telling them so much among what he told them was, I'm going away very soon. You're not going to see me anymore. But I'll come back. Again, the disciples had to have been a little frightened at that, thinking, where, where is he going? What is going on? And then, toward the end of the night, they up and leave the upper room. They head to the Garden of Gethsemane, and while they're out there, Judas brings a whole mob of people, soldiers and others, carrying clubs and spears and swords, a fight erupts. The disciples stand bold for a moment, but ultimately we're told they fled. They ran away. They were scared. Peter, we're told, got his distance away, but was curious enough to kind of follow in the shadows. Standing around the fire that night, he got called out three different times by people saying, hey, hey, you look familiar. You're, you were with that Jesus, weren't you? Of course you were. And it scared Peter to death because he knew if that connection was made and he was associated with Jesus, that same fate could befall him. Through the night, on to the next day, Good Friday, Jesus hung on a cross, nailed to a cross. The disciples were still nowhere to be found, hiding, scared, with the exception of one, John, who was there with Jesus' mother Mary and some of the other women who were his followers there at the foot of the cross, but the horrors of crucifixion itself had to frighten them to the very core of their being, seeing the horrors of their beloved Jesus hanging there, bloodied and beaten. They heard his words. They heard his cries. They heard his last breath. And he was dead. And how terrifying death is. He was gone. What do we do? What do we make of everything that, that Jesus had talked about? Everything that he had done. Everything we saw. And then we come to Easter morning crack of dawn, as the, the very earliest the women could, they got up and were headed to the tomb to prepare Jesus' body properly for burial. And what happened? An earthquake. An angel came down from heaven, rolled back the stone, and sat on it. And first, it was the guards. What did we hear and see? It was the guards who were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. Ignoring the guards, the angel then spoke to the women and said, Don't be afraid. I know you're looking for Jesus, who is crucified. He's not here. He has risen just as he said. And then Jesus appeared. And he told the women, What? Don't be afraid. But go on. Tell my, 
friends. I'll meet them in Galilee. And after that, the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid, yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Fear was a part of the Easter story from the very beginning. And understandably so. The world was being turned completely upside down. Things were happening that shouldn't happen according to the natural order of things. Expectations, hopes, dreams of Jesus' followers. They died. They were shattered. And they had to be refashioned. Shaped into the reality, the true reality, that Jesus had now come to bring. He understood his friends. He understood some of their misdirected ideas, expectations, hopes. Even though multiple times he had told them again and again exactly what it was that was going to happen, how all of this was going to play out, and over and over again, they missed it. Fear, anxiousness, confusion, misdirected ideas, hopes, dreams. Jesus got it. He knew. And folks, Jesus still gets it. He still gets us. Because we're not all that different from Jesus' friends and his followers from 2,000 years ago. There are still lots and lots of misdirected ideas about Jesus that are out there today. And for those who believe in him, as well as for those who don't, unfortunately, fear and anxiousness and confusion, they are all very much part of our lives and of our world today. And I want to pause here for a moment to allow us to realize our place in this story, an important place, a real place. What are some of those things that cause us fear, to be afraid, to be anxious, to be confused? Or what are those things that we experience or things that are trying to raise those kinds of emotions in us day in and day out? So I want to give you a moment to think about that, and I would encourage you to have some conversation with the people who are sitting around you. Talk about what are some of those fears? What are some of those things that cause us to be anxious? Take a moment, please. So whether they are true to you or more in a, in a general way, uh, share with me what are some of those things that are out there today that, that can or try to cause fear, 
anxiousness, confusion in us. Scott? Yeah, the societal changes that don't align with Christian values. And oh, how many there are, right? So many things that, that fall under that umbrella. Other things. Mark? Yeah, uncertainty. Yep, uncertainty with jobs, with community, economy. So much we don't know what's coming. And, you know, while we, well, yeah, things continue to change at a crazy rapid pace. And we don't know what's there and what's coming. What else? Pat? Yeah, so many of your descendants, your family, who don't know, who don't believe, and, and anxious for them because they don't. Hmm. Other things. There is a lot, isn't there? about around almost any corner we look, there is something else that's trying to pull the rug out, that's trying to scare us, that's trying to take the hope that we're here to celebrate today. Now hear this. Jesus does not want us to live in fear. He doesn't even though there are times, plenty of times, when fear or anxiety or confusion or all those other things creep into our lives. Again, that's reality, even for us as followers of Jesus. Because we too are broken, sinful people who are living in a broken, sinful and sometimes pretty messed up world. We hurt, and at times we may question at the death of loved ones, family members, friends. We can feel anxious when finances are tight, the threat of a job loss or an actual job loss or as we continue to watch food prices utility prices every other price continue to escalate we struggle at times in our marriages we struggle with parenting we struggle in in some of our relationships we go to the doctor and we hear the word cancer and it strikes fear in our hearts or the doctor comes and says I don't know what's causing all this for you so just because we believe in Jesus and the miracle of his resurrection that we celebrate today it doesn't mean that we're exempt from fear or anxiousness or the problems of this world. Again, Jesus knows us, and he knows exactly how hard life can be sometimes. And that's why he says over and over throughout his word, from beginning to end, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid afraid and what jesus here is not doing in all of those instances he's not berating us he's not putting us down because 
we're afraid. But he's reminding us that we don't have to be afraid. And he's reminding us that when we do fear or feel that anxiety rising or other emotions, he reminds us what to do. And what are we to do? Well, this isn't exactly a, a perfect parallel. I think it works. We come back to the message of the angel to the women. Do you remember what he said? Starts out, do not be afraid, for I know you're looking for Jesus. And that's what we're supposed to be doing. We are supposed to be looking for Jesus. Not because he's lost, not because we can't find him or don't know where to look to find him, but we are to be looking for Jesus. That is to say, our eyes need to be open to see and to recognize Jesus at work all around us. That he is here in our midst. He is here with us in the joyous times, in the struggling times, in the happiness, in the fears. What we're celebrating today isn't an Easter Bunny fairy tale, but what we're celebrating today is someone and something that is very real. An event grounded in history, shrouded with mystery, and involving real people at real places in real time. And it's a miracle that has changed the world and a miracle that has the power to change each of our lives. And that power comes in realizing the forgiveness that is ours, the forgiveness that Jesus won by his sacrificial death on the cross, the willingness that he had to lay down, give up his life in order to free us so we don't have to live with guilt or with shame. That miracle of his resurrection, rising to new life once again on that first Easter morning, the power of that is a life which is ours. A life that we've been given to live right here, fully, freely, enjoying the many good things. Yeah, it's messed up. Yeah, it's broken. Yes, it can be absolutely crazy. But this is a good world. It is good to be alive. It is good to enjoy the life that God has given to us. And the power of the resurrection gives us not only the here and now, but the promise of a life that will never end for all who believe and for all who trust in Him. And what that means is we don't have to be afraid. We don't have to fear or be anxious because we have a God who loves us and a God who is here promising, I'll walk with you through those fear-filled times, through those times of anxiousness, confusion. You're not in this alone. And that, my friends, can be life-changing. Changing the way we approach our vocations. Changing the way we relate to one another. Changing even how we look at ourselves. If you're not there right now, I would invite you, encourage you to take a bold step of faith and say, Lord, I do believe. I want to experience that life-changing power that you have come to bring. 
all that this day to day means. Because what Jesus has given to us are words to live by. And over the next seven weeks, we're going to be digging into God's word and mining out some awesome nuggets of truth. Words that our Lord has given to us to live by. Life-giving, hope-instilling words that can speak to the reality of all of our lives. Each week, starting today, I'm going to be including in my What Now several verses from the readings of each week. And I would encourage you to take those words, tape them to your bathroom mirror, tape them to your computer monitor, and try to memorize them. Yes, even us old people can memorize. But to put these words to live by into our heads and into our hearts. Carry them with us. And keep coming back. Keep coming as we continue to worship our Lord and Savior in these weeks to come, being filled, being reminded, being poured into again and again. Words to live by. And this week's words, if you want to grab your Bring It Home devotion, the insert, it's also up on the screen, it is from Matthew 28, 5 and 6. Do not be afraid. Actually, why don't we read this together? Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus, who is crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Words to live by, friends. Words for our heads, words for our hearts, words for our lives. Because Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. I invite all who are able to please stand and we join in confessing our faith. 
on this Easter Sunday using the words of the Nicene Creed, words drawn from the truth of God's own word that followers of Jesus have been professing from early on the truths of the resurrection, the truths of who we know our God to be. And so on this Resurrection Sunday, we again join our voices with those gone before us and with those who are here with us, boldly confessing our faith together. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated for our time of offering, a time not of guilt or arm twisting, but a time of gratitude. The offerings that we give, whether they're left in the offering baskets out in the atrium or given through the website or through texting or through the app, they serve the same purpose. The opportunity for us once again today to simply stop and pause in the midst of our worship of our risen Savior and say thank you. Thank you for the life, for the power, for the grace, for the people, and for the blessings that he has poured into us. Knowing that the gifts, the offerings given to the Lord through his ministry here at Emmanuel will be used to the best of our ability to further that mission he has given to us of sharing this great good news with our community and beyond. Would you join me now for a word of prayer? And in our prayers today, we've got a, a number of requests that we want to include. Those are for Barbara Tuttle, whose mother Sarah passed away peacefully earlier this week. Funeral was Wednesday in Georgia. And Barbara wanted to say thank you to all who have been praying for her. Ongoing prayers for Tara Schultz and her sons, Aiden and Kellen following the service for her 59-year-old husband and their dad, Don Schultz, on Wednesday. For childhood friends of Rachel Basil at the death of their 55-year-old dad, prayers for comfort, peace, and strength for all of these families. Ongoing prayers for Lori and Ron Adson's son, Gabe, for Charlotte Layton, Ray and Bernice Zimmerman, Mike Hunziker, Isaiah Mercado, and Bob Angus. Prayers for Sue Busacker, who's remained hospitalized, who was in hospital, who, excuse me, who was hospitalized in Greeley for much of the week uh, due to an infection following her surgery. For Gary and Carlita Gossel, both diagnosed with COVID, Gary also was hospitalized much of the week uh, with additional complications. For Dick and Sally Smeeting's son-in-law, who's been diagnosed with shingles and more. For Joe Rubel, a former member now living down in Georgia, who is hospitalized again. For Tam Small, as she prepares for knee replacement surgery on Tuesday. And prayers of thanks for Ed Schreck, whose follow-up tests have been very good so far. Prayers for yet another upcoming doctor appointment and follow-ups. And for Shane Reining and Julia Gentry, who were married yesterday. 
we continue to pray for our country and for our world as well. So let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Father in heaven, you raised your son Jesus from the dead. And today we once again celebrate that victory, that miracle of miracles, bringing life and hope back to our lives and back to our world. Fill all your people with the joy of his victory and send us into your world with boldness and with joy to share this good news with everyone in our lives. Lord, in your mercy, open our eyes each day to the living Christ as we pray for and work with all those who are struggling or hurting in any way for the brokenhearted, the sick, those who are grieving, and those who have experienced loss due to natural disasters or man-made evils. Hear our prayers for those who are close to our hearts. We pray for those who are lonely and homebound, the sick, the dying, all those we have named, as well as all those requests which have gone unspoken this morning, but are very much on our hearts and minds. Those in our own circle of friends and acquaintances whom we know and care about who need you right now. In your resurrection power, lift them up, give them renewed strength and hope, bring healing, help, comfort, and guidance, all according to your good and gracious will. Give to us all a renewed faith by which to live our days in you. Lord, in your mercy, King of all kings, remember in your kindness all who carry authority in our land, and give them wisdom and integrity that they may serve all people wisely and well and according to your desires and on the foundation of your word and your truth. Lord, in your mercy, guard and protect all those who are on the front lines and who serve us in a variety of capacities, all in healthcare professions, law enforcement, firefighters, first responders, and all who serve in our military. Lord, in your mercy, Empower our lives to be a living witness to your resurrection, being made whole by your love and care. Into your hands, O oh Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy, through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who has also taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And on this Resurrection Sunday, we come to the Lord's table in that joy and confidence to receive again what the Lord knows we need most. So our Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread. When he'd given thanks, he broke it, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also after supper, he took the cup. When he'd given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant that is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. And if there are any of you here today wondering whether or not you should come and receive the Lord's Supper, would you ask yourself these four questions? First, do you know Jesus? Do you believe and trust in him as our resurrected Lord and Savior? Second, do you acknowledge that sin and brokenness in our own hearts and lives and desire what the Lord offers here? Forgiveness, healing. And third, do you believe our Lord's words? profound, mysterious words, but words we believe are true. That what we receive today are bread and wine, and also the very body and blood of Jesus. And finally, fourth, would it be your intention with the Holy Spirit at work in your heart that you would look for those opportunities to live in and share boldly that amazing good news of Jesus and the power of his resurrection. If you answered yes to these questions, this gift is for you. We'll have two serving stations this morning, one on each end of the communion rail. Simply follow the direction of the ushers as they point you where to go. 
children and young people not yet instructed in the Lord's Supper, you're invited to come for a blessing. Or if they're adults who would prefer simply to receive a blessing today, please come with your hands folded to indicate that. Otherwise, have your hands cupped to receive the bread. My friends, the table is ready, and the peace of the Lord be with you always. Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I'll stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless babe, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save till on the cross as Jesus died the wrath of God was satisfied for every sin on him was laid here in the death of Christ I'll live There in the ground his body lay, light of the world by darkness slain, then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again, and as he stands in victory, since curse has lost its grip on me, for is and he is mine bought with the precious blood of Christ no guilt in life no fear in death this is the power of Christ in me from life's first cry to final breath Jesus commands my destiny no power of hell no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home here in the power of Christ I'll stand no power of hell no scheme of Till he returns or calls me home here in the power of Christ. And Messiah, hope for 
able to please stand in the body and blood of our risen Lord and Savior strengthen you in heart body mind and faith to be the people we have been called and created to be as his children for these times and the Lord bless you and keep you the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you the Lord look on you with favor and give you his peace Amen. be seated for just a moment longer. Thank you once again for joining together on this Easter Sunday, both here in person and those joining us online. I do pray that we are filled with that true sense of joy and hope that this day brings. Uh, by way of announcement, a couple things. First of all, uh, there's an insert, a larger insert in your announcements or in your worship folder that lists some of the big things coming up. Just take note of all of that. Uh, we are also, we've got some job openings that we are looking to fill, including a director of facilities, a part-time custodian, and several teachers. So as you're aware of those or know of people who may be good fits for that, reach out to us and let us know. We are also excited to be exploring the starting of a high school here at Emanuel, very early in those stages, but asking that question, praying about what that could look like. So 
be in prayer with that. And then uh, for the children, we've got Miss Martha has some uh, Easter bags for you out in the atrium. Do check those out. And, of course, breakfast in the gym. Time to support our youth and their uh, servant trip coming up this summer, an opportunity for good food and for fellowship. The best way to know what is going on, celebrating the things that have happened, what's coming up, are through my email updates. I send those out about two times every week. If you're not in that email group, but would like to be, to hear more about what's happening and keep up with what's going on here at Emmanuel, stop at our information station just to the left out in the atrium, grab a welcome card, give us your name, your email address. We'll be happy to add you into that. Next week, as I mentioned, we continue our Words to Live By Easter series as we'll be delving into 1 Peter and some of the powerful, powerful things he has to say to us in regard to hope and in regard to life. I hope you can join me. Until then, Christ is risen. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Joy out.